What I want to next talk about is some of the contextual governance structures that we have in our coastal zone. There's several things we, we have a whole class just talking about the legal side of things. Obviously our class is centered on a whole bunch of things, not just the, the legal and policy issues, but um, uh, we need to talk about the Coastal Zone Management Act and a couple other things, but one of the most important tools to manage our coastal zone in California is the California Coastal Commission. So I want to talk about that today, but before we get to that, first want to put it in a little bit more context. The California Coastal Commission is one example of a regional approach to management and governance. This is um, a quote that I like, um, and so I'll just read it here from uh, a former professor at Harvard, but it, basically it goes, only one approach appears possible to concurrently maintain ecological integrity and basic human needs for the built environment, that is, to plan and manage the urban landscape as one of several linked landscapes considered together. The group as a whole could then theoretically be sustainable. So this is talking about this notion of our traditional boundaries maybe are not the best ways, or, or maybe not the best boundaries to hold going forward. Maybe we need to do things with a different degree of overlap or, or interaction. So that gets us to this idea of regional planning. So not just our local city, uh, not necessarily our local county, maybe something bigger than that. So in the simplest analysis, by planning, we're talking about all the stuff that we do. So economic development, um, ecological goings on of water moving in and out of our system, energies flowing in and out, uh, social structures, entertainment, that kind of stuff. Um, most of the things that we think about aren't constrained to the city, to the county, right? We go to a concert in Santa Barbara, we go to a concert in Los Angeles. So Ventura County is maybe not the right place to regulate concert going necessarily, right? And so on and so forth and it goes on and on. So this notion of regional planning is in response to that recognition that not everything is geographically contained by these, um, ex by the smallest of our political boundaries. So here's uh, another quote I'll read for you guys. The more complicated analysis suggests that every place and every issue is best addressed at the spatial level that enables us to understand how that particular region works and how it can particularly be acted upon. Okay, so again, this notion of what's the proper scale? I'm trying to talk about the scale of the resource, the scale of the management relative to the, the historic political uh, spatial extent. It also means that ideas and actions which are based on the interconnectedness of all these things, of all these systems, must tolerate some ambiguity in the application of the quote unquote regions concept. And accept that ultimately it's a functional pragmatic idea. That's key. Regionalism is a pragmatic solution. Doesn't work well when people are trying to be demagogues and, 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 and grab power and stuff like that, right? It's, it's a messy thing. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to have one simple rule as to what the region is going to be for California, what the region will be for Florida, what the region will be for New York, et cetera. Uh, where was I? Uh, and, that, and that particular scope of the region that best helps to address effectiveness of those in interconnected issues is the region <coughs> excuse me, that we mean. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so let's look at this in the context of our state. And while we could go back even further than that, let's just let's talk about the early 1900s as a starting point for this, this notion of planning and orchestrating management decisions. So we start out, what I'm showing you here is phase one. And really here, the big, uh, big goings-on is really all about um, home rule, that we, we power centers, we, we big city or whatever it is, um, we say what happens. We say how things go. The emphasis primarily is on local scale infrastructure, local scale roads, say local scale piers and, and harbors, stuff of that um, ilk. Counties are beginning to come up, right? So we're about to have, we're approaching our 100th anniversary in about 
six years of the county of Ventura. We were originally part of Santa Barbara. We were all one big giant county, then we split. So that in the, in the um, you know, well, we were established in the early 1800s, but we split uh, later. This notion that, um, that counties are a great place to make decisions is still new at this time, right? It's still really the, the big city, the traditional adobe, the traditional uh, political power center that's making most of the rules and decisions. This is really fostered on especially by, in Southern California, Los Angeles, and the formation of the modern mega city that is Los Angeles for us. And farther up north, it's going to be primarily San Francisco. Big power centers that are making all the rules, making all the decisions. As we go from that early phase into the World War II and the post-World War II phase, we see a bunch of different forces at work. In the context of our planning discussions here, suburbanization is a big part of that. So the development of these residential areas outside the traditional urban core. As that happens, people are now spreading out over a larger geographic area. As they're spreading out over a larger geographic area, we start to, excuse me, start to see political fragmentation. We start to see different uh, power centers emerge, and those once all-powerful cities start to lose some of their clout. So again, this leads to this post-World War II era, which was dominated by more and more suburban development, suburban planning, suburban needs, and really saw the rise of a greater overarching state level uh, policy in terms of building codes, in terms of road, you know, roadway specifications, all that kind of stuff. We first here see the emergence of what are voluntary institutions that um, uh, come together as, uh, as a planning entity. So not required by state law, you don't have to do it, but hey, this city, Santa Barbara has an issue and uh, Ventura has an issue and we kind of think that we are, you know, have the same problem, maybe it's widening 101 or something of that nature. And so we can see that on some issues we can get together. So these larger um, <clears throat> community organizational groups. Importantly, what we see is <clears throat> the agencies, and we see this to this day, the agencies that have the greatest power, that have the most authority to make a decision or to enforce a rule or what have you, are the ones that are the most narrowly targeted. Entity, uh, governmental entities, agencies that have much broader policy charges tend to be organizationally pretty weak. So an extreme example we might think of would be something like the fire department, right? So the fire department or the fire marshal. All the fire marshal cares is going to go around and say, hey, is this building safe, right? It is in the context of fire. Can people get out of this building in an emergency? Does it have proper sprinklers, right, et cetera? So those guys have a very narrow uh, uh, charge, right, very narrow responsibility. And it's really obvious. Are they, are they doing their due or are they not doing their due? And it's, it's pretty cut and dry what they have to measure. Mosquito vector control districts might be the same thing. What do you, what do you, what's your goal? Make sure there's less mosquitoes around, right? Compared to something like NOAA, compared to something that has multiple goals, multiple levels, multiple things, it's, it's much less clear how we, how we go forward and get something um, uh, permitted or acted upon. We're currently in what we might call the third phase of this regional, re, of regionalism in California. And this has really emerged since the modern environmental laws the birth of the mo modern environmental legal framework that started in the late 60s and continued on into the early or mid 1970s. So in this era, when we talk about regionalism and thinking about regionalism, transportation, especially in California, especially in Southern California, transportation and environmental concerns really come to dominate 
the thinking with regards to regionalism. This notion that air, air pollution that comes out of you know, uh, factories in region A is not going to be contained to region A, right? That pollution is going to float up, and it doesn't matter if this is a county line or a district boundary, the air is going to go where the air is going to go, right? So, so pushing more of this sense of regional planning and, and the notion of regionalism. In this era, we tend to think more of, instead of um, the traditional urban core as the center of home rule, regionalism has become a dominant force, right? So regionalism is, is how we think about air quality. We don't think about air, what, what Camarillo tells us about what the, the particulate matter should be. We think instead, what does the regional air quality control board say the, the particulates in the air should be? Um, and we see more and more, into the <clears throat> more and more sophisticated integration of policy across these air, across uh, traditional boundaries and um, and a, a greater emphasis we talked a little bit about this when we met when we talked about the notion of facilitating exchange and facilitating a stakeholder engagement this is this is in a sense another version of that which is this notion of uh, more focus on collaboration so not necessarily creating yet another organization but but work to make sure that the existing uh, organizations and agencies work well to each other to, together and the classic example would be CalFed which you guys have never or, or may not have heard about that's in the San Francisco Bay Delta and it's, it's short for the California Federation and it links California state agencies with uh, Department of Interior uh, federal agencies to work on improved management of the San Francisco Bay Delta let's look at okay sorry so <clears throat> Um, here's a couple quotes from one of these regional entities. This is the Bay Area, <coughs> excuse me, the Bay Area Council <coughs> about working together. So uh, I'll just read them for you. We have to agree that every change creates winners and losers. We can navigate. We can make a change so that everyone wins in the region as a whole, not just each fiefdom. So the notion that, hey, if we do this right, everybody will benefit. And let's take the example of a transportation project. So everybody, so the 101 is slowing down and pinching, right? And if we do it right, and we collect in the city of Camarillo and Thousand Oaks and Oxnard and, and on and on, if we all get together and, and, and work on something as, as a collaborative endeavor, maybe we can make the 101 be better. And then it doesn't clog up. And that's a benefit for Camarillo and Thousand Oaks and Oxnard and Ventura and whoever, right? Um, the intensity of concern around transportation and housing su suggests we've got this brewing collision. We really view this as reaching crisis proportion, and we've got these problems solved in the region, uh, or and, and we've got to get these problems solved in the region, or it's going to be a threat to the economy. So you also see this notion of, so when we can do it, yeah, we can make it better, but also the acknowledgment that uh, if we don't get this right, there's going to be a lot of downside. And you're hearing a lot about this, for example, in the recent presidential debates and presidential election, that, that the, the consequence of not having effective planning. Um, and then to finish up that first quote, so the notion is that, hey, we can do better, right? We can do better if we plan regionally, but mo many of the appointees of these groups are still, their paycheck still comes from the city of Camarillo. The paycheck still comes from the city of Thousand Oaks, even though they're working in this collaborative uh, way or this regional um, a group. And the challenge is that you have to both ideally serve your local constituents and serve the region as well. And that gets hard when you have two masters, essentially. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'll just, I'll just uh, finalize by saying a, a poll from several years ago now. Um, uh, the Public Policy Institute of California um, found that 89% uh, of the public would like our government folks to work better and work more collaboratively. And that has not changed much since then. Okay, so let's talk about some of the existing regional agreements, some of these, some of these 
structures to facilitate regionalism and, and broader scale collaboration. These are just a few. Um, if we talk about statewide, we have air pollution control districts. We have airport land use commissions. We have the various COGS, so-called COGS, Council of Governments, um, of solid waste things, regional transportation agencies, et cetera, regional water quality control boards. And then we have stuff in specific regions. So the Bay Area Air Quality Management District is, is this guy is one of the specific components of this overall statewide air pollution control board. So, so we've carved up the state into different districts and we have uh, regional units that, that talk to each other. Um, something, uh, Tahoe Regional Planning Commission, again with air quality, we have our South Coast Air Quality Management District, et cetera. And then we have the California Coastal Commission. The California Coastal Commission only acts in specific regions and that is the coastal zone. More on that later. Let's look at an example of regionalism that's not us, so we can, we can look outward and see some, some examples um, outside of us. And so this would be what has gone on in and around the city of Portland, Oregon, the so-called metro, Portland metro area. So this would be what we would consider a regional approach. And it started in 1978 <clears throat> with uh, folks from um, uh, the regional, from the, from the region. This district, this area, spans three different counties and 24 different cities in the greater Portland area. There is a council president that, that everybody, you know, has a say in from across the region. And then there is a certain number of counselors, there's six from each of these districts, uh, each of the, of the areas around. So we have this notion of representation. Everybody can have a say. Everybody is represented. And then um, the, the formal <clears throat> uh, current charter was approved by folks in 1992. And the number one goal <clears throat> of this regional uh, institution is to manage growth, to not let growth be rampant, to have intelligent growth that's planned, that we account for the benefits of growth and try to mitigate the, down, the negative aspects of growth. And they do that primarily through a, a, a vision statement and then they have a plan that enacts that vision statement. And so just, you don't have to write this stuff down, but just you know, to give you a sense for some of the things they, they work on, land use planning, transportation planning, how much green space and where should that green space be, et cetera. Um, so some things are relatively specific like supporting major civic projects such as uh, civic centers, et cetera, or you might have conferences and the like, and things like the Oregon Zoo, um, and then specific um, uh, endeavors such as trying to foster more composting within the metro region. If we look at one of the components, uh, one, of their, one of their issues is on trying to improve and manage fish and wildlife habitat. And so they do this through, in this case, in, well, with this component of it, they're trying to do a better job. First step says, hey, we need to map, right? So this is a, this is a comprehensive planning effort. This is not someone that's handling the garbage, not someone that's handling the transportation. They're doing comprehensive planning, which almost always begins with data acquisition. And in today's era, that almost always begins with GIS. So you nothing in the law says you have, or the, the charter organizations say you have to, charter documents say you have to do that. But I'll tell you, in practice with these regional things, the very first step is build a GIS. Build a GIS and let's populate it. Populate it with, with income data, populate it with infrastructure data, populate it with all the different data layers that we need. And that's how we get going. And so the first step here was to do that exact thing. Uh, next was to look at alternatives. Hey, if we were to, uh, you know, make the river better here, what might the economic consequence of that be? And then once they've sort of vetted their, and evaluated their options, they say, okay, we're going to go with option A and D as far as uh, fostering better fish and wildlife habitat. And yeah, we, we, we can skip this basically. It's just, uh, that's how it works. So several steps. <clears throat> now, the challenge of this type of approach 
to planning and and all that good stuff. Let me close the door. The challenge here is that by ver by the very nature, these regional entities don't fall neatly into the traditional political boundaries or, 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 or political districts. So we often have or potentially can have poor policy coherence, meaning maybe the city of Thousand Oaks has a specific charge for how to deal with waste, but the city of Ventura has a different uh, charge. So how do we make these two things talk to each other, right? So you have to work across political boundaries and that is always a challenge. Many folks don't understand this re still relatively new idea of regionalism, right? So am I reporting to my, my, my regional entity or am I reporting to my city? Well, you're, you're, you know, your paycheck's probably coming from your city and they don't necessarily always, you know, so if, someone, if it's someone that interacts with the regional entity, then they probably understand it. But if it's somebody that, that their work doesn't routinely put them into contact with this regional entity, they don't get it. Why, why are you spending all this time over there? You know, you're not getting your stuff done here, that type of stuff. Very, very important. Along with that comes a lack, or oftentimes, or, or can come, a lack of enforcement and accountability. So if we're all coming together from across the region to make, let's say, this transportation plan, that sounds great. But if in the 11th hour, the city of Camarillo pulls out, is, is there any downside to the city of Camarillo? Maybe, maybe not so much, right? It's not really clear. So does that mean that therefore we're not going to do the improvements on the 101 freeway? Probably not. We're probably going to do them because we're going to still get the benefit. But, but so, so that, that, uh, that sort of accountability and enforcement of all the different members and all the sort of messy constituencies can be a challenge. Wrapped up in that is oftentimes lack of funding. Because most of these organizations uh, don't have their own funding stream, sometimes they do. For example, again, use the vector control districts. Sometimes uh, one of the reasons we create vector control districts often is to levy taxes in the area whereupon the, the mosquito abatement is going to take place and those folks might be have, have a fee or tax leveled against them so 10 bucks a year each household has to pay and that money might go directly to the um, mosquito abatement district the vector control district but most of the time it's not that way most of the time it's the city of camarillo has to contribute some funding the city of thousand oaks has to contribute some funding etc so this notion of of uh, not a clear funding source is a huge challenge for these groups And, and, and again, um, as you're seeing play out now in, in our recent election uh, and has been playing out in the last several years, there, there can be this fundamental opposition. And you hear this a lot. You hear this about local control, local control. And what you generally see is fee people and, and groups that tend to favor collective action tend to support regionalism and, and regional type approaches. Folks that really want to have a high degree of individual choice tend to not favor these things. What is this? Right? I voted for my city council. I didn't tell my city council to go be on the regional transportation control board. Like, what's up with that? And so these are these are real tensions, and uh, you know, to to an extent, these are very, these are healthy things to have, but they can get to the point, perhaps as they are now, where they've gotten so acerbic, they've gotten so corrosive that they're they're making it hard for things to function. Uh, nevertheless, so the last little bit here, as I said, so even with all these challenges, lack of funding, who's accountable, etc., cetera, um, this really is uh, oftentimes the best way to approach a lot of these challenges that are not constrained to the city or the county uh, jurisdiction, et cetera. And, and classic examples would be pollution, unemployment, housing, traffic. So uh, you guys will be voting on SOAR tomorrow. SOAR initiative, assuming you guys are voting in the county of Ventura. 
you might also have additional SOAR measures uh, within your city, where, wherever you're registered to vote. Um, and SOAR is a, is, a, is a classic example of this, where um, it's, it's not exactly the whole county. It, it basically is a county, but there's all this other stuff. But this notion of, hey, we have to solve, we have to solve, uh, let's say, where we put our housing at the larger level. And if we just leave it up to the cities, one city is going to take off, and then the other city is going to want to compete with, with them, and, 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 vice, and vice versa. And it tends to lead a race to the bottom. The reason Ventura County does not look like the valley, the San Fernando Valley, is because of regionalism and, and the planning that's gone on here for the last many decades here in Ventura to try to, to, try to be more purposeful about how we go forward. 